Hey, thanks so much for coming to our YouTube channel. You're about to hear a message from one of our Sunday experiences, but before you watch it, do me a favor and click the subscribe button so you can catch all the new videos coming out each and every week. Enjoy today's message. Luke 19, verse 28. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, which is the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent with the, went their way and found it just as he had said, but as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they sat, and he set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Underline that, please. This is what they were shouting, and this is what they were saying as they were rejoicing. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Your other Gospels of Matthew and Mark and John would say, Hosanna, Hosanna. They would, that's what they would say uh, in that particular portion. Verse 39, as this is happening, some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Would immediately cry out. Go back to verse 37. Let me read that one more time. As he drew near the descent of the Mount Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praising God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. I want to preach to you today a message called, I've seen too much. I've seen too much. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts. We're ready to receive what you have to say. Lord, thank you for the privilege of preaching. It is an honor, and I do it today with fear and trembling. Holy Ghost, speak through me. Move me out of the way. Whatever you want to do, but I thank you that your word is living and it is active. And it will do what it has been sent to do. We thank you for the truth of your word. For it is your word and your word only that sets the captive free. So I thank you for freedom today. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. On your way down to your seat, just tell the person next to you, Hey, I've, I've seen way too much already. We are always waiting to see what happens next. As human beings, we have this thing about us. We always want to see what happens next. What happens next? Uh, my wife and I are currently watching a Netflix series. And yeah, and um, we've, we've uh, as I, as I I'll, I'll be having a birthday this month and I'll get a little older and I've found out I can't binge watch stuff like I used to. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so um, I'm, a, I'm a good, I'm good for like two episodes right now, and then I got to go to bed, and uh, I'll just catch you tomorrow night. <laughs> um, but, but watching the episode where it is very intriguing, it's, it's thrilling, it's suspenseful, it's mysterious, all of that, and I'm just, I can't wait to see what happens next. We're, we're, we're almost done with the whole series, and I'm just like waiting to see what happens next. My wife, on the other hand, she has this issue about her that I just, can I be honest with you, can't stand. Can't stand it. I'm walking, I'm walking lightly here, just because she's not sitting on the front row, so. But what she likes to do when we're watching a series or a movie, in the middle of it, she gets so fed up with having to wait to see what happens next, she Googles. The ending of said series. And she has to look ahead to find out what happens next because I can't watch all this. I know it's killing you to watch 45 minutes 
of a TV show, but she has to look ahead to see what happens. Just the other night, we're sitting on the couch, and I'm, I'm watching this episode, and she's already fed up. She's like, these parts don't even matter. Why are we even, can we just fast forward? I'm like, babe, we got to watch the show. We could miss something. You know, I'm all glued in. Like, we can't miss anything. And she's, I'm getting on Google. I'm getting on Google. Like, babe, don't get on Google. That's stupid. Don't get on Google. Just watch the show. No, I'm going to get on Google. All right, well, don't tell me anything. Okay? I, I, I like to, I want to live in suspense. I don't want to. Google what happens next. Please don't tell me what happens next. And she's done this on numerous occasions. But, but that's just, that just speaks to more of our, 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 our humanness, our, 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 our side of humans. We, we, we always want to know what's going to happen next. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? When, when is it going to happen? What's going what's to happen next? We, we want to know how the next episode is going to end before we've even watched the next episode. We, we, we want to know what new thing that a company it may release to the public. We want to know what's next. We want to know what's next. We, we, can, we can prove that by how many iPhone series have come out. Like how many uh, from one all the way to 14, 14 Pro, 14 Plus, 14 Max, how many other 14s we got. And we always want what's next. We want to see how the next sporting event will go as we are leaving the one we just attended. Like I just watched the, the, the semifinals of the Final Four last night, which were incredible. And I can't wait already for tomorrow night when the championship is played. I'm already looking forward to what's next. And I, I'm still thinking about what just happened. I mean, a dude hit a game-winning shot as the buzzer went off off last night and it's one of the most amazing things that can happen in, in basketball period especially during this time when it's such a high pressure time and, and I'm, I'm already like oh I can't wait for tomorrow night after I just saw something incredible I'm already looking forward to what's already going to happen next and it hasn't even happened yet may I suggest to you we want to know what God is going to do next when we all don't even realize what he's doing now and we're always looking forward to what is he going to do next? What is, what is next? What is, going, what, is, what is he going to do? What's, what's going to happen? But I've, I've also found out there are two common places that a lot of us get stuck in and make us miss what he's doing now. Would you like to know? Yeah. I found there's two. I was like, hold this side. This whole side was quiet. Do y'all want to know the two common places? I feel like, okay, there we go. My God, it's Palm Sunday. Two common places I've found that I've experienced and have been in that a lot of us get stuck in and make us miss what he's doing now. One of those places is how come he hasn't done it yet? How many wants to have some, have some questions like that? Lord, when are you going to do it? How come it hasn't happened yet? When are you going to do the thing I've been praying for? When are you going to move and perform the miracle that I'm believing for? How come you haven't done it yet? Some of us are here and we're resting in this place and we're asking questions and we're, and, but we're missing what's happening now because we're focused on how come he hadn't done it yet. Right? How come he hadn't done it yet? But then the other place we, so a lot of us get stuck in is just what I've said. What's he going to do next? What's he going to do next? We get stuck here and we get stuck in, how come he hasn't done it yet? What's he going to do next? This question produces worry, it produces anxiety, it produces fear, and it produces anxiousness because we're so focused on the future, we have no time to enjoy what he's doing now. And we get discontent with where we are now because we're so focused on what's he going to do next with me? What's he going to do next in my life? What's going to happen next in the relationship? What's going to happen next in my finances? What's going to happen next at my school? What's going to happen next at our church? And we can live in this place no matter what category of business you are in, no matter what phase of life you are in. You can be stuck in this place wondering what's he going to do next and be filled with worry and be filled with anxiety and anxiousness and we can't, we can't focus on what he's doing now and we're missing it. But then there's others of us, <clears throat> we're asking the question, how come he hasn't done it yet? 
And this, this, this produces frustration. It can produce anger. It can produce all these things that, that come up in us. When we get angry, we get mad, we can get bitter, and we can get closed up. And we can start closing ourselves up because God, we, are, we are like, God, I know you see what I'm doing, dealing with here. I know you see what's happening in my life. How can you let this happen? How can you allow this to take place in my life? When are you going to do this? When are that, is that family member going to get saved? When am I going to be healed? When? is this thing going to turn around? Why do I have to keep up waking up morning after morning and still dealing with the same thing, Lord? When are you going to do it? And a lot of times, I've been in both places. Anybody else? I've lived in both places. And as I've lived in when, how come he hasn't done it yet? I've missed what he was currently doing. But then when I came over here to what's he going to do next, I got anxious, I got all tense, I got all weird, and I missed what he was doing currently. And so, so we, get, we, get, we get enthralled with that, and we can, we can miss those things. And, and I, I want to show you something in the, what the Bible calls the triumphal entry. It's what it says in my text. It's, it's labeled as the triumphal entry. That Jesus comes in on this donkey, and, and the Bible says that as he's coming in on the donkey, that, that the disciples, they have put their clothes on the donkey for him to sit on, but they also begin to spread their clothes on the road for the donkey to ride on. Isn't this incredible? Can you imagine the scene? Uh, we were there just a few weeks ago to see this Mount of Olives, the descent, all the things, man. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a climb. It's a steep little descent going into the city of Jerusalem. And it's a, it's a, it's a pretty awesome thing to see. And I could, we could just picture Jesus coming in on this donkey and, and people just on the sides waving, according to the Gospel of John, palm branches. And, and they've laid their clothes down on the road. And here comes Jesus riding in on the donkey. And and, and the first thing I, I have to ask is, how did, this, how did this begin? Like, how did they know just to go ahead and do that? You ever ask that question? Like, okay, I know he's the Messiah. I know he's king, but he's on this donkey. Why did these people start taking their jackets and garments off and, and, and start cutting down palm trees and begin to create this parade that ushered him in and to the gates of the city? And, and I ask these questions because what, like, what initiated that? Who, who, where did that come from? Where, why did they start doing it? And I believe it was something called recognition. They recognized that something was happening in front of them. They weren't living in what was going to happen next. They weren't stuck in, why hasn't he done it yet? But they had the ability to recognize what was happening right in front of them. In fact, in Scripture, in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13, there was a king who was being anointed, anointed as king. His name was Jehu. In 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13, he was being anointed as king. And, and the Bible says that the people came and took their garments off and laid them on the steps for him to walk on top of. And so we can conclude that kings would have garments laid before them by the people that would usher them in to their palace or to their throne as king. Thus causing the crowd to say, you are the king, we recognize you as king. Amen? And so now these people, they recognize what's happening. They recognize that Jesus is riding in on this donkey. I want to go back to the instructions that Jesus gave the disciples. Isn't this amazing? In verse 30 and through 35, I didn't read you that portion. It was just before he got on the donkey. He told two disciples, he said, go ahead to the village opposite you, and I want you to go find a donkey. In fact, he said, you're going to go find a donkey that no one's ever sat on. No one's ever sat on this donkey and rode it. Then he said, I want you to loose it and bring it here. And he said, if anyone asks you why you're loosing it, here's what you're going to say. The Lord has need of it. That's the instructions he sent them with. Go into the village opposite you. You're going to find a donkey that's tied up that no one's ever sat on. And here's what you say to people when they ask you why are you untying or loosing that donkey. Sure enough, they go ahead. They go to the village. They find the donkey tied up. And sure enough, the people are standing there asking why are you loosing this donkey. And the disciples, the disciples he sent respond by saying the Lord has need of it. I just want to talk about the power of recognition and radical obedience. Recognition and radical obedience because if we don't recognize the things that God is doing in front of us, we are sure to miss. We are sure to miss moments of praise and celebration that belong to him. 
we are sure to miss what he's doing. And I want to uh, bet you right now, I want to bet anybody in the room that God is literally doing something in your life, but because you're stuck in either of two places. Has, how come he hadn't done it yet? What's he going to do next? You are missing what the Lord is currently doing. Thus, it's robbing you of joy. It's robbing you of peace. It's robbing you of contentment. It's robbing you of faith and hope and expectation because you don't think he's not doing anything currently. Because you look around your life and you don't see much. You don't see a whole lot. You look in the mirror and you don't think you see anything good that you're looking at. You don't think you see a champion staring back at you. You don't think you see a winner staring back at you back at you but if you could tell your testimony and all the hell you've come through and all the battles you faced and all the things that you have overcome and all the addiction that God helped you break and all the provision he did provide for you and bringing you through family issues bringing you through divorce bringing you through loneliness bringing you through counseling sessions bringing you through medication bringing you through anger issues bringing you through all of those things and yet you can sit here and say God isn't doing anything or hasn't done anything in my life I came to declare I've already seen too much I've seen too much in my life he's already provided for me in a way I couldn't have provided for myself he, he brought me out of addiction he brought me out of anger he brought me out of the things I was having to deal with all the struggles I was facing he brought me out of all of that I've already seen too much for me to be silent and so since I've already seen it I might as well thank him for it I can't worry about the future I, I can pray Pray about it, I can sow into it, and I can expect it, good things are going to happen. But if I live in that place, I'm going to be worried. If I live in that place, I'll be anxious. If I live in that place, then I'll be fearful. I can't live in fear. I can't live in the spirit of fear. I can't live in the fear of man. I can't worry about if I make decisions about the future of my life, how people are going to respond to that. That's when I fall into the fear of man. And some of us are hinging on greatness, but because we are assuming other people's responses to our decision we won't make the decision necessary thus we stay stuck in a cycle of complaining because we are fearful of what people will say and do if we make decisions based off what the Lord is leading us in come on somebody say I've seen too much I've seen too much already I've seen too much I don't know what God's gonna do next I know he's gonna do something I don't know what it looks like. He's the only one who knows for he is Alpha and Omega and he has already set the end from the beginning. So he already has everything he's going to do already in him. Can you fathom that for just a moment in our human minds? God already started with the end from the beginning. From the foundations of the world, he had the lamb that was slain. So before there was even a problem, he already had the solution. And yet here we are, worried, anxious, making worrisome decisions, not bold decisions, not decisions that say, God, I trust you, but we're making things based out of fear, out of anxiousness and anxiety. But be still and see the Lord. And we're stuck in one of two places. And the disciples recognize that, the, that something is happening in front of them. They have the power of recognition, but they also have radical obedience. Because watch this. Jesus sent these disciples to go do something that they apparently didn't, didn't. I don't know if they even realized what they were doing. He just said, go get a donkey. Nobody's ever rode on it. It's going to be tied up. And here's the words you're going to say when somebody asks you about it. Incredible. Radical obedience. You know what some of us would have said? Well, why I got to go there? Hold on. Wait. Let me, can I go back to my closet and fast for like three days to make sure I hear from you? Because you're telling me to do something that... How do you even know the donkey's there? What if I get there, Jesus, and there's three donkeys? And we start asking these questions that there's no need for answers to. And you have these disciples, I don't know who they were, the Bible doesn't, I don't think the Bible says who exactly the two disciples were or the disciples were, but he just sends disciples and they just go. I'm just going to go and do what he says to do. It don't make sense to me right now. My logical brain can't really make sense because up until this point, Jesus has walked everywhere. And he's walked on water. He's walked down from mountains. So the donkey would have been a good use going up the mountains. Right? Because donkeys are built for that kind of terrain. But now you want a donkey to what? 
You've walked everywhere. And now you need a donkey? Like, these are the conversations that some of us have with God. Do you understand that? And all the while, we're missing out on the blessing that we could discover if we would just obey, if we would just be obedient, if we would just do it and not take a whole lot of time to figure out, uh, to, to try to solve the equation. And, and I can't tell you how you hear from God. All of us may hear from God in a different way. And so, but I, when I sense the Lord leading me in something, when I sense the Lord leading me in something, uh, most of the time it's going to make my flesh uncomfortable. Okay? And there's some things that you don't have to, like I told you last week, you don't have to pray about because the scripture already tells us things like you need to forgive one another. Pray for your enemies. And so if I have, if I have uh, 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 an ought or a wrong with my brother or someone, then I need to go to him and make that thing right. I don't have to pray about that. It's already written. Right? But that obedience is going to push against that flesh, that pride, that makes you feel uncomfortable going to someone and trying and attempting to make things right. So anytime we have spirit-led instruction, it will always combat our flesh comfort. It will always combat that. Giving. We talked about giving earlier. Anytime I'm obedient to God's word to give, anytime I sense the Lord leading me by his spirit to give, whether it be money, whether it be other things, or, and just give, some of us may experience a pushback. We may experience, well, uh, well what am I going to do? We may experience that flesh fight that comes up. Because when you are led by the Spirit, it will always combat flesh. Why do you think that Scripture says after Jesus was baptized, the Spirit led him into the wilderness? Luke chapter 4. After he was baptized, the Spirit led him not to a palace but to a wilderness. The Spirit had to have led him there because his flesh wouldn't have wanted to go. And seeing some of those places, I wouldn't want to walk there either. But the Spirit, not the Spirit of God, leading Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights? Not the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is always going to lead us into places that push against our flesh because the Spirit and the flesh are always at odds and contrary and fighting against one another. But let me tell you this. When you feed your flesh, it feels good. When you feed your flesh, when you look at the thing you don't need to be looking at or you do the thing you don't need to do or you say the thing you know you shouldn't have said but it just felt good to say anyway because you told them. You're only reinforcing the flesh man even stronger. But when you are meek, the meek shall inherit the earth. When you are humble, when you are a person that is, uh, ha walks in humility, which is not weakness. Humility is strength under, under, under uh, control. When you operate in that, you strengthen the spirit man that resides on the inside of you. Are you with me? And so obedience then turns into a way to put our flesh into submission and to do the will of the Father, to be led by the Spirit. Put your hands on your belly right now. Say, Lord, lead me by your Spirit. Help me to be obedient with radical obedience. The disciples had no idea that when Jesus said he had need of it, that it meant his triumphal entry as king was about to take place. How did they know? Jesus knew what was about to happen. That's why he sent them. But the ones he sent might not have known what was about to take place. They just had to obey. Can I tell you something? You never know what one simple act of obedience will unlock in your life. What one simple act of obedience to obey the voice of the Lord will unlock into your situation. What it will cause to take place. One simple act. One simple act. 
is all it takes to unlock a new level, to unlock a door that you've been praying for. One simple act of obedience. I'm trying to help you to get into the, 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 the vein of hearing the voice of the Father and asking Him to speak to you. Do you ever ask the Lord, Lord, speak to me? I want to hear your voice. If not, that needs to be a repetitive prayer, not out of religious prayer, but out of a need to hear from God because His voice is the very creation of life. He spoke and things were created. So I need to hear that creative power that he wants to speak into my life because he knows where I'm going. The Bible says that the, who knows the, the mind of a man except the spirit of a man. But then it says who knows the spirit of God or who knows the mind of God except the spirit of God. So who knows what's on the mind of God? The Holy Spirit. Who do we have on the inside of us if I'm a born again believer? The Holy Spirit. And so I need God to speak to me and lead me by the Spirit of God that's in me into the places He's calling me to go. And to do the things He's calling me to do. How do I do that? I feed my spirit man more. You become sharper when you get in this word and you begin to study it. And you might not know all the things you need to study for, but just getting one scripture in you. One scripture applied is better than ten memorized. I'm glad you memorized scripture. We all should memorize scripture. We should be ready at a moment to know what the word of the Lord says. But how good is it to memorize it if we never apply it? There's power in the application. That's where the transformation happens is in the application. And so these, are, these disciples, back to the story, are the, they are representing that. They are demonstrating radical obedience. They are moving into a village and trying to go find a donkey like, think about the, uh, the craziness of this whole thing. I'm going to go in a village and just start untying a, the, the donkey I see. And that's going to be the donkey I'm going to go take back to Jesus. And he's already given me instructions on what to say. Think about that. And you never know what one act of obedience can unlock. And I, I highly doubt these disciples knew that their act of going to get the donkey was going to turn into uh, the, the start of what we now call Holy Week. The start of Holy Week when Jesus entered on what's called Palm Sunday to enter into Jerusalem as king. Let's keep going. As he's riding on this donkey church. He is riding on this donkey and now the people are throwing their clothes out. They're throwing their garments out. And they're shouting, the Bible says, with a loud voice. They're, they're rejoicing, in fact, the scripture says. And they're praising God for what? The things they have seen. Because they've already seen so much. If you follow Jesus, you're going to see some stuff. That's all I'm going to tell you. You're going to see some, some stuff. And they saw some stuff. And as they're doing that, watch this. Watch this. As they are shouting the praises of Jesus, as they are thanking God for their Messiah, for the King coming in, it says from the crowd, that same crowd, there's some Pharisees. These guys are always showing up. And from the crowd, they yell to Jesus. Watch this. As the crowd is singing, Hosanna! Thank you, God! Here comes our king. As they're shouting that, you got Pharisees saying, hey, tell your disciples they need to be quiet. Jesus is riding in on a donkey and people are praising him because the people recognize who he is. They recognize what's happening. And the problem I have with the Pharisees, I got many problems, but the problem I have with this time is, is they don't recognize what's happening and they're the ones that should recognize what's happening. Just how you can be in church for 20 years and not recognize when God steps into the room because you have become desensitized and turned it into an attendance check sheet rather than an encounter and a relationship development day with God. That's how you miss what God is doing. And I say these Pharisees should know more than anybody else what's happening is because it was prophesied 500 years before this. Jesus is in the middle. Watch this. He is in the middle of fulfilling a 500-year-old prophecy. I can prove it to you. I got receipts. Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse Number nine, it says that the king comes in lowly riding on a donkey. That's what Zechariah chapter nine, verse number nine says. It says, 
Let me read. I'm, I didn't mark it in my scripture. Y'all bear with me. I got the old school book. Here we go. Je- Zechariah chapter 9. It says, Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's what Zechariah prophesied 500 years years before Jesus actually did this. And the ones who should recognize the fulfillment of this word from the Lord are the ones looking at him saying, tell the people following you they need to be quiet. How terrible is it to have God in flesh moving right in front of you, touching lives, changing lives, doing great things, and yet you become focused on something else that has nothing to do with the fulfillment of his word. I want to tell somebody, if Jesus, the perfect one, who had no sin, who had no spot, no blemish, he had no sin, he was the perfect man who came down and lived and showed us how to live by the Spirit, if he came down, And in the middle of him living out the word of God for his life and yet still had to deal with people who didn't see him as God has called him, then what makes you think you are going to be uh, not going to have to experience that? We as human beings are going to experience those who push back on the call of God on our life. And, and, And people, when they fall and they make mistakes and they have sin and they fall short constantly because I fall short. You fall short because Romans tells us all have fallen short of the glory of God. There are no positions that keep you from falling short. It just causes a little bit more damage when you have a more influential position. That's why the enemy is so strategic. He wants to wait till you get into a place where you have great influence over people and then you fall and ha- into sin and it causes damage. That's why when pastors fall short, it causes so much damage. But the problem I have is that when pastors fall short, that man starts to disqualify them on what they can do and what they can't do in their future. The question I have is, what if that's what they were put on the earth to do? They were called to preach the gospel. They were called to minister. But because they had a moral failure and now now they've gone through restoration and now they've gone through some healing and now they're accountable. Now they have wisdom and people speaking over their lives. Now all of a sudden they're not called to do that thing anymore. The devil is a liar. That's what Jesus came to do, to restore to seek the thing that was lost. We have the ministry of reconciliation according to Scripture. God is all about reconciling people back into right standing. In fact, the Bible says He made Him who knew no sin to become sin so that we could become, become, become the righteousness of God. You need to realize that becoming is an ongoing process. When I pray a prayer to say yes to Jesus, when I gave my life to him, that was the start of the becoming. I didn't become that immediately. It's called a process of sanctification. You need to study that. Sanctification. I begin to walk and I begin to go through the kindling of the fire of the furnace and he begins to work out of me all of the impurities. He begins to work out of me all the things that are not of him and he begins to refine me so that when I come forth out of the flames, I shall come forth as pure gold. That is scripture. And so now I've got to go through a process of becoming and we are all becoming. I know the person next to you thinks they're perfect, ain't got nothing wrong in their life, but they are in the middle of becoming more like him every single day. The problem is man with their religion and all their rules start to to determine who is able to get back into their calling and who is not. So that tells me if I fall short, I'm no longer called to preach. Well, if that's the case, then Peter shouldn't have been reinstated. And Peter did something, I think, crazy detrimental and and crazy terrible, right? You denied Jesus. Something Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. I don't know if you get any worse than that. I mean, if, sorry to compare. I'm just saying. And yet Jesus shows up on the shore with some, some fish and grits is what it was. Fish and grits. Had, had a little cheese in it. He was from Georgia. And yet he calls Peter and he says, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. Second time, do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? 
Feed my sheep. He asked him three times, and I think that's so significant and revelatory because Peter denied him three times, which tells me there's always restoration for every single thing that we fall short in. And the one that most denominations would have said, he can't preach anymore, he don't need to be in ministry anymore, was the very one in Acts chapter 2 the Lord used to stand up and to declare the good news of Jesus Christ to thousands of people that began his... He used a messed up... Can, he used somebody that denied him to start the church. Tell them to be quiet, Jesus. They don't need to be shouting this. How do you not recognize what's happening in front of you? Is it because he hasn't done it yet? Are you stuck there? Or is it because you're worried about what's going to happen next? And that's because Jesus came to them in a way they didn't expect him to come. Jesus rides in on a donkey, not a war horse. In those days, a conquering king would come in on a war horse, a stallion. And they would be ushered in by the praises of people. And they would end the parade at the temple, which they would go in and worship the gods, S, gods, thus cementing their role as the king in a godlike fashion. Jesus does it all. He just turns all that on his head. He comes in on a donkey which is an animal of peace. And he rides in on a donkey, an animal that represents not war, because the people thought he was about to go take out the Roman Empire who was oppressing the Jews at that time. He thought he was going to go t move them out of the way with his power and take his throne in the natural. But they did not realize, they did not see with spiritual eyes, and that's why the Pharisees could not recognize that Zechariah 9 and 9 was coming to pass because they wanted their Messiah to come back like a, a, a military person. But he came as a gentle king, a king riding on an animal of peace, the donkey that represents that, with the people waving palm branches. Oh yes, he went to the temple after that, but he didn't worship no gods. He cleaned the house. Thus establishing, this is why I have come, to clean the inside of temples. And so they don't recognize it because they were expecting him to show up in a way that he is not showing up as. I wonder if today there's some of us are not recognizing the fulfillment of a word of God coming to pass in our life because we don't recognize it because we want it to come a certain way. I love Jesus, and I love what he says next, the famous words, right? In the middle of all, Hosanna! Tell him to be quiet. In the middle of all this, he's riding on a donkey, looks back at the Pharisees, and says, if these should keep silent, the stones will cry out. Now, I love that response, but if you'll allow me to present to you a little bit different perspective of what I think he's saying here, if that's all right. Can I dig in a little bit? If, the st if these keep silent, the stones are going to cry out. What are the people doing? Verse 37 says they're rejoicing and praising. Right? Jesus doesn't say, if these keep silent, the rocks are going to rejoice and praise me. He says they're going to... When you start looking at Scripture, and you start walking through the Word of God, you're going to come across some, some things that you're going to need help. And finding out what does this mean? What is the layer under this? What does this actually say? And there's something when reading the scriptures called the law of first mention. The law of first mention 
is a principle or a rule, and it is used as a guideline that many use for studying Scripture. The law first mentioned says that to understand a particular word or to understand a particular doctrine, we must find the first place in Scripture that the word or doctrine is revealed and study that passage. The reasoning for this is that the Bible's first mention of a concept is the simplest and clearest presentation. Doctrines are then more fully developed on that particular foundation. Are you with me? So to fully understand a complex theological concept, a word, or a phrase, those of us that study the Bible, hopefully those who follow Jesus, we're studying the Bible, must be advised to pay attention to the law of first mention. You with me so far? And so, the first part of this phrase that Jesus says that jumps out to me is the phrase, cry out. Because he doesn't say praise here. He doesn't say rejoice. He says, cry out. And I'm, I'm wondering, okay, he didn't repeat what they were saying. He just said they're going to cry out. If they keep silent, the stones, the stones will cry out. And so I got to go back to the law of first mention. And I wanted to find out where is this phrase cry out first used in scripture to give me a little bit understanding of what Jesus might be saying here. And the first place I find it is in Genesis chapter 4, verse number 10, when Cain kills his brother Abel. Cain kills his brother Abel, and the Lord comes to Cain and says, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. This is the first mention of something that doesn't have a mouth crying out. This is the first place we find where God says, cry out. And it's in the context of Cain murdering his brother and God saying to Cain, it's your brother's blood that is a witness against you. Your brother's blood is testifying, it's crying out against you for what you have done. And then it took me to Joshua chapter 24 verse 26, where Joshua is at the end of the book of Joshua and he is leading the nation of Israel to make a covenant with God. He's making a covenant with God and the people there to make God their God and the one that they follow and the one that they serve. And they can make a covenant saying, we're going to follow him and we're going we're to serve the Lord only. That's the covenant they make. And in this moment, in Joshua 24, verse 26, it says, Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone, and he set it up under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Verse 27, and Joshua said to all the people, behold, this stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord, which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So we got the first use of cry out being a witness against Cain. And we got Joshua using a stone as a witness against the people of God if they deny him. You with me? Habakkuk chapter 2. Verse number 9. The prophet Habakkuk is writing about some woes, some things that, that are going to come against the greedy man, the wicked man. And he's writing something against how a greedy man, if, how he builds his house. And so the context of this scripture, scriptures, he is writing it towards that audience, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians that were coming, that overtook the, the people of God, overtook Israel. And held them captive. And so he's writing in that context of how a wicked man, if he builds a house this way, this is what's going to happen. Are you with me? He, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 9 says this, Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. For the stone 
will cry out from the where? The wall. And the beam from the timbers will answer it. There it is, the very same phrase Jesus uses in Luke 19, verse number 40. The stones will cry out. Habakkuk 2, writing in the context of what's going to happen when a wicked man builds a house the way that he's been building it. The stones from the wall will cry out. And then I get to 1 Peter chapter 2. I didn't give him this, so it ain't going to be on the screen. But it says, therefore to you who believe, verse number 7, 1 Peter 2 verse 7, he is precious, he meaning Jesus. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Don't, it don't end there, verse 8. And it has become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. I want you to take all that, put it behind the context of Jesus, writing in, fulfilling a word from God. And he has people present who recognize him, people present who do not recognize him. And to the ones who do not recognize him, he says to them, the stones are going to cry out. Now, we could believe and we could think, which, hey, awesome. Many songs have been written, written about that, that stones would grow mouths and start to sing. But if I could suggest to you to dig a little deeper and see that what if Jesus is really saying here, after all the works I've done, after all the things you've seen me do, after all the miracles I've worked, out of, after all the darkness I've brought some people out of and I've, I've raised the dead and I've, I've healed the sick and I've walked on water and I've multiplied the loaves and the fishes and I've healed leprosy and I've caused blind eyes to open. I, I touched a coffin and a, a little boy got up that was once dead. I, I, I did some miracles. I, I performed after all those things and the people keep silent, then the stones are going to be witnesses against them for not saying and giving me what I rightly deserve. That's just another way of saying these people have seen too much to stay silent. They've seen too much to not worship me. They've seen too much to not give me praise. And if they don't give me my praise, these stones are going to be witnesses against them for generations to come. Which now makes more sense when you read what he says after. Stay with me. Because after he says the stones will cry out, it says as he begins to approach Jerusalem, he wept over the city. He wept over it. One of the few places of scripture we see Jesus weeping. He weeps at the tomb of Lazarus and he weeps here when he sees Jerusalem. Why is he weeping over Jerusalem, James? Why is he weeping? The Bible says, he said to the city as he was weeping, if you had known, they didn't recognize him. If you had known, even you, especially in this, when? Not what he hadn't done yet. And not what we were wanting him to do next. In the present. If you could recognize what I'm doing in the present. The things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come. Now he's talking future. Because you could not recognize me in the present. It's going to affect your future. The days are going to come when your enemies will build an embankment around you. They will surround you 
and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one upon another why it's the next part because you did not know the time of your visitation Everything Jesus prophesied in that moment took place when the Romans destroyed the city. And the stones of the city, which many theologians believe he wasn't just talking about stones on the side of the road. He was speaking to the stones of the temple that had been used as a bartering place, as a, a den of thieves that he went in immediately after this ride on the donkey and began to clean out. And he said, you've made my father's house a den of thieves when it should be a house of prayer. And they believe he was speaking to the stones that the temple was built with. And you connect that with what he said, the stones will cry out. And he's weeping over what the Lord sent him to. is because his people that he sent him to did not recognize him as the chief cornerstone. And so they did not recognize him as the, the cornerstone. That he became the stone that was rejected. He became the stone that was not recognized as the Messiah or the Son of God. And so the result that took place was that the stones of Jerusalem became witnesses against all the people who did not recognize him as Lord and as Savior and as Master but for those who didn't keep silent for those who had a praise they had already seen too much they shouted his praise all the more they gave him glory no matter what and the Bible says this watch this in verse 37 it says the multitudes of the disciples began to rejoice and praise him they began somebody say began the Greek word for began means archomai archomai means to go first that means that nobody in the crowd had to tell them you should start praising nobody in the crowd had to tell them look what the Lord has done you know why because they could look around at their own life and they could look around in the crowd and say there's evidence all around me I'm gonna go first what if somebody just went first on Sunday morning and didn't have to wait for the praise band or the musicians what if we just archimide every single week and we just went first no matter what no matter how you were feeling no matter what happened that that week I'm gonna arco my my God I'm gonna begin to go first I'm gonna give him a first praise I'm gonna give him a first hand clap I'm gonna give him a first shout and you know why it says multitude of the disciples because it's not just 12 disciples there there's more disciples that follow Jesus I could tell you who's in that crowd there's a man called Bartimaeus he used to be called blind Bartimaeus but as Jesus was leaving Jericho a few chapters earlier blind Bartimaeus wouldn't stay silent and he kept shouting and he shouted all the more and as he kept shouting it says Jesus stopped not in what he hadn't done yet and not what he's going to do next he stopped right where he was and said what do you want me to do for you and Bartimaeus said I can't see and he heals the man and the Bible says Bartimaeus followed Jesus I can tell you who else is in that crowd a man named Zacchaeus about a chapter earlier he used to be a crook he used to be somebody who did people wrong but one encounter with Jesus and he stood up and said I'm gonna pay back everything plus more to everybody I've done wrong that's who's in that crowd I can tell you who's in that multitude of disciples a woman named Mary Magdalene who was possessed by seven demons but one day she came in contact with the master she came in contact with a rabbi from called Jesus of Nazareth and when she came in contact with Jesus of Nazareth those demons had to flee she's in that crowd can I tell you there's another man in that crowd who was blind and Jesus made mud and he put it on his eyes and he told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam and he went to wash and the Bible says he came back seeing and when he could see he followed the voice that he heard when he was blind he followed the voice that he had heard that told him to go wash can I tell you there's also one more person in this audience in this multitude of disciples and his name is Lazarus and Lazarus used to be dead but when Jesus came to where he was 
not where he had been and not where he was going. He came to the tomb where he was and he called his name. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And the Gospel of John says, this triumphal entry had all the people there that saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And Luke says, they began to rejoice and praise because of what they had seen. I came to let the devil know you can't stifle my praise. I came to let the enemy know I'll never get quiet. I'll never be silent. I'm not going to let something else be a witness against me because I don't praise God for all the things that he's done. I've seen too much. He's healed my body. He's mended my family back together. He's been a provider. He's kept me sane in the membrane when I wanted to cut some people out and give it all up. He's kept me in perfect peace when I should have lost my mind. He's been a good, good father when everybody else thought he was bad. He's been my deliverer out of addiction. He's been my chain breaker. He's been my yoke destroyer. And I can't stop praising him now because I've seen too much. I dare some people to give him a crazy Palm Sunday shout of praise and start praising him like he's done some things for you. I know he's gonna do some things next. And I know you're wondering, when's he gonna do the thing I'm waiting on? But if you would start praising him for what you've already seen, for what you've already seen, I dare some people to go to shout. I dare you to start using your feet. This isn't a casual praise. This isn't a cute Sunday morning praise. This is he's done something for me praise. Come on, come on. I dare you to run to three people and say I've seen too much. I've seen too much. I've seen too much. said I've seen too much. Go to three other people and you're going to testify. He brought me out of bondage. He brought me out of depression. Some of y'all almost killed yourself. You had the bullet in the chamber. You had the pill in your hand and you was about to end it all. But then something started to happen when you started to remember the goodness of the Lord and you say wait a minute I can't end it here I've seen too much go to somebody else and testify come on this is Palm Sunday we're ushering in the presence of the Lord he's been too good for us to be normal he's been too good to us for us to be calm giving praise rejoice for all the things you've just seen. Where all the Lazarus is at? That he got up out of a tomb. Where the Mary Magdalene's at? That were crazy. Where's blind Bartimaeus at? All you could see was the bad you have done. But when you came in touch with a man named Jesus, you started to see something different. My life changed when Jesus came in. I'm no longer the same Jordan I used to be. And I don't know what kind of Jordan I'll be in the future. But all I can thank him for right now. I said all I can thank him for right now. Is who he's brought me to be in this moment. I've seen too much. I've seen too much. Yeah, I got some stuff I could complain about right now, but I've seen too much to even... I've seen too much. And the reason the Pharisees couldn't rejoice, they ain't seen nothing. 
You know why they ain't seen nothing? It's because they couldn't see him. I told you, when you live for Jesus, you start seeing stuff. Not in a spooky, weird way. You just see. Because your dependence is no longer on what you used to depend on. It's on Jesus. I came today just with one message and one message only. And that is Jesus. It will always be and only ever be Jesus. It is because of what he did on the cross that we are here. And I want to end it with this. Jesus' week started with a parade, but it ended in pain. That's how quickly things shifted. But he fulfilled the word of the Lord. And he rode in with shouts of Hosanna from one crowd that was shouting Hosanna. That's how his week started, Chris. But his week ended with another crowd shouting, Crucify. All the religious leaders were looking for Jesus that week because it was the start of Passover. And all Jews go up to Jerusalem for Passover. And so the city was busy. It was crowded. And the Jews were wondering, they ask, and you can look in the Gospel of John, they're looking, will he come up to the temple? They're asking these questions, when will he show up? Because they're wanting to take hold of him and seize him. And Jesus, knowing, knowing what will take place in his life, gets on a donkey and says, I'm not hiding anywhere. You're looking for me. Here I am. And he rides in, in a parade. If you was trying to hide, that's not the way to go about it. And yet he rides in. The only time that I can recall, do your, this is what my studies have shown, the only time Jesus actually acknowledged publicly he was the Messiah. By allowing the crowds to shout it. And his week ended with, uh, his week started with celebration. And his week ended with crucifixion. And some of us are wondering, why is God allowing me to suffer the way that I am? Because we don't preach about suffering. He allowed his own son to come down and suffer. Paul talked about how, how he suffered with him so that he might glory with him. And right now, right where you're standing next to somebody, there may be some people suffering, and you're wondering, why is God allowing me to suffer? It's not because he hates you. He don't hate you. How come right now I'm in the middle of this? I want you to look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Who the scripture says, for the joy set before him endured the cross. We like to celebrate the riding in of the donkey and forget all about how the week ended with nails going through his hands, with whips, with pieces of glass on the end that when it whipped him, it ripped out chunks of flesh, exposing his inwards. Other people's saliva on him because they spit on him. crown of thorns, not nicely put on his head, jabbed down into his skull. And he was not clothed. We think that he had this little cloth on him. He was naked, exposed for all to see, hanging on a cross. And he took all of that shame, stretched his arms wide on a cross, everything exposed, suffering unmercifully. And he won't.
wants you to know today, he did it all for you. He did it all for you. He did it all for us. I want you to pray for your neighbor. You don't even, maybe you know who you're sitting next to, maybe you don't. Maybe some of you feel awkward right now because I don't know this person. Why are they touching me? It's just something I want you to experience and allow the person next to you just to lay their hand on on your shoulder or grab their hand, however you want to go about it. But Lord, we pray for our neighbor today. Lord, the things of life that happen, the things that go on in our life that ups and downs. And one week we start off like it's a parade and the next week it feels like hell on earth. And we don't understand why, but through all the suffering, We know there is a reward. We know you have never left us nor forsaken us. And Lord, we will be careful to not stay silent because of the suffering. Suffering can cause us to be quiet. Suffering, Lord God, can cause us to to be overwhelmed so much we don't even feel like saying thank you, God. But like you endured the cross, I'm asking, Lord God, for our neighbors, our brothers and sisters right now, for endurance, God. That they have not seen anything yet. They've seen some stuff you've done. But God, there is more ahead. But we're going to stop right in the present and say thank you for all that we have seen. Because you have done some things. You have done some good things. Leviticus says you gave us new mercy this morning when we woke up. So thank you for new mercy. Some of us should not have woken up because of what happened last night. But the goodness of God cause another breath to come into your lungs and I declare today that spirit of defeat and failure to break in the name of Jesus generational words that were spoken over you that said you would never do it that you could not be a good mom or a good dad we break that lie in the name of Jesus Christ and we thank you that we have help that comes from the hills So that's what we look to, Lord. Today I declare a freshness. I declare a rejoicing. As the disciples rejoiced as you entered into Jerusalem, we ask you now to enter into this situation, enter into our home, enter into our mind, and we rejoice and we say, come Lord Jesus. Do what only your power can do. We need you today. All emotional trauma, all emotional trauma that we're still battling. I declare today the wounds you took on your back and the bruises that were inwardly done to you were for our emotional healing and our physical healing. So we pray for our neighbor today. We might know him or might not. It does not matter, but what does matter is you know everything they're dealing with. And I declare, Lord God, we come to you today for you say your burden is easy and your yoke is light. And we take on the peace of God that passes all understanding. And we stand in the midst of our trial and in the midst of our circumstance. And we declare boldly, as Jesus boldly rode into Jerusalem, knowing they wanted to kill him. And we declare with that same boldness, I'll worship you still. I'll praise you yet, Lord God. For you've been too good and I've seen too much. If you enjoyed this message, why don't you go ahead and share it with someone, a friend or a family member, and follow us on social media at Hope Church WR. And we'd love to see you on a Sunday morning right here at Hope Church. Thanks for watching.